Okay, Second Chronicles chapter 12. And it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom. He's in authority. He's in the rule. And he had straightened himself. He forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. When he straightened himself, he got himself in his own pride. Pride is nothing of God. Prideful men don't follow God. Look how good I'm doing. And again, that's the same ways of his father. Look how great I am. Look at the house I built. Look at the houses I built. Look at. And when you see pride when you're doing Kings and Chronicles and Samuel and all the books of the Bible, when you see pride, you're going to see a fall. And you're going to see the anger of God. And it came to pass that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shechak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord. Here comes Israel's enemy. Why? There was conflict? Nope. We want to take dominion over another piece of land? Nope. Why was the attack of Egypt upon Judah? Because it was it was God doing it. Because of the transgression of Judah. God says, fine, you want to transgress me? I'm going to send your enemies at your back door. And this is the chastisement we see in Hebrews 13, that if God is your father, and the Bible says for fathers, in the in the Bible it says fathers are to chastise their children, that book of Proverbs, you use a rod when your child gets out of line. You are to use correction and when God's children get out of line. He's going to correct you. And that's one of the fears we, we, we should have. We have the fear of mom and dad. If I do wrong, I'm going to be punished. If I do something wrong in the eyes of God, though my mom and dad don't see it or don't know, I still will get punished. And we have churned into society today, all the world mostly. We've gone away from correction and chastisement, and we got a messy environment. So if God's going to chastise his children, the children of Israel, he will chastise his children, Christians. And if he's going to chastise Christians, he's going to chastise his children. Jacob's trouble is all seven years of God chastising that Jew for going against his word. And the proper response of the children of Israel at the end of seven years, the, the remnant, the very few remnant that will be left will be wrapping their arms around God, Jesus Christ, and saying, we are sorry. So this battle or this war of Egypt came from God with 1,200 chariots. I thought, I thought Solomon had chariots. Three score thousand horsemen. I thought Solomon had horsemen. Matter of fact, these would be the same horses, the same chariots that he got out of Egypt. So it would be a match for match. And the people were without number that came with him out of Egypt, one. Libans, two. The Sukims, three. And the Ethiopians, four. That's the first time Ethiopians show up. In the Bible, plural. And these four nations get together to go against Judah because they've sinned. And they're without number. You look out towards the south in Judah, here comes this mass of numbers of, of chariots and horsemen and people coming at your back door. I thought in chapter 11, we look, look what it says. He said, uh, Verse 11, chapter 11, 11, 11. And he fortified the strongholds and put captains in to and store victuals in the oil and wine. And every several city he put shields and spears and made them exceedingly strong, having Judah and Benjamin on his side. Chapter 12, God is against you. You can have all the strongholds you want. 
America is filling her cup. And the day that that cup gets full, like Solomon's cup, uh, uh, not Sodom's cup got full, and like Babylon's cup, cup got full, and Greece's cup got full, when that cup gets full and you can have all you want, you can have all the nuclear weapons you want and one button. If God's against you, you're not going to win. The anger of God is now. And he, Shishak, took defense cities, 1111, which pertains to Judah and came to Jerusalem. Wow, you, you, made, him, you made him strong? God found a weakness. You know, not happened yet, but it will happen at the close of Chron Second Chronicles. Is that, uh, uh, no, at the close of uh, the Daniel and all that, I mean. Babylon is conquered by the Medes and Persians. A royal great city of gods. Stronghold. They said they, there were chariot races around that wall. On top of that wall, those cities. There was two great walls. Massive. And the enemy drained and rechanged the whole course of the water so they could drop the water enough so that they can go under the wall through the water gates of that city. And they went that way, went in there and conquered the city in one night. That's it. When you have God against you, you have no military. We saw in 11 strongholds, we saw weapons and shields and spears and men and chariots. God's angry with you. You ain't got nothing. Verse 5, and then came Shemeliah the prophet to Rehoboam and to the princes of Judah that were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shishak. I mean, everybody now, they're all in this one big meeting. Here comes the enemy. What's going on? And he, the prophet, said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, ye have forsaken me. Therefore, have I also left you in the hand of Shishak, or Shishak, however you want to say it. You're not following me no more. Here's your enemy. You're not doing what I told you to do. Here's your problems. And we need to learn that one of our problems, one of our problems, one of our problems, not all our problems, one of our problems may be for the Christian is because we're not following God, we're forsaking him and not obeying him. One, not all. One of the illustrations that we may have problems in our life because we have forsaken God. Some way, somehow, some shape, we've got sin and God's chastising us. That's not preaching pulpits all around the world today. It should be, because that could be a cause. In the end run of devil trying to get Job and get Job to fall, God behind the scenes of the devil was trying to work on the self-righteousness of Job. So in the classification of Job, who did wrong? The devil, God, and Job themselves, all three. Why was Job getting what he got? Because the devil hated him. And God was trying to rebuke him. God was trying to chastise him. God was trying to wake him up. And when God chastises the Christian, not because he hates us, chastisement in the Bible is because he loves us. And there's nothing wrong with saying, and people say, you can't question God. There's nothing wrong when you've got problems and trouble to say, just stop and say, Lord, why? And not what power authority do you have this to do this to me, but Lord, is the problem, why? Is it because I'm not right with you? We are out of fellowship. And God will answer you correctly. If you are out of fellowship, if you have forsaken God, he will show you. He is must have to show you if you're truly seeking from your heart. Because he doesn't want to correct you. He doesn't want to have to beat you. He wants to give you love. He wants to have you blessed. He wants to be in a fellowship with you. And if he has to get your attention because you've sinned against him, he wants you, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And if you want to know what sin you're doing, if it's the chastisement of God, he will show you. So you can get right. God's not a mean, nasty God. 
Verse 6, whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves. So see, they had pride. And said, the Lord is righteous. And when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemshiah, saying, they have humbled themselves. Therefore, I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance. And my wrath shall not be poured upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. All right, they've repented. They've gotten right. Still need a little more beat and still need that hiney to be hurting a little bit so you can learn your lesson. Now, don't think that moment you say, oh, God, I sin. I know what's wrong, and I know why you're chastised. Oh, Lord, God, put me in the blood of Lord Jesus Christ. And then don't open your eyes think your problem's going to go away just right in there. Yeah. You know, if one of your chastisements, whether it be a doctor, a disease, something like that, it, not the next time you go to the doctor, it's not going to be, oh, wow, well, you're miraculously healed. And there are times in my life I still remember, and I thank God for my mom chastising me. I still remember those days. Not every single instance, but that keeps me from, I better not do that. I better watch out what I'm doing. And the conscience that God's given me, and the, and the godly mother, though she wasn't saved then, for chastising me, for punishing me, thank you, mom, for doing it, because you taught me the fear of not doing it. Uh, wrong. I mean, not doing right, and then I got the fear of God of not doing right. Chastisement brings the fear of God, and the fear of God's a healthiness in your life. And we too much, we think, you know, we just pop in our prayer quarter, and God's going to give our, you know, the bubble gum that we want, and the flavor we want, and the color we want. It's not happening. That's not happening. Yeah, you better believe chastisement leaves a memory in your mind. It also will keep you out of trouble. I know personally. I know growing up as a kid, there are many things I wanted to do wrong. And my mom, remembering how she how she corrected me, the love that she had for me, that stopped a lot of times. Not all of them, many of the times. Nevertheless, they shall be his servants, that they may know my service. And the service of the kingdoms of the country. If I'm going to teach you how to serve me, I'm going to have, to have you serve another enemy. Because I am your enemy right now. You need to learn how to serve. You got too prideful. So I'm going to send somebody else to teach you how to do it. There's nothing more, and I've had this happen a few times in my life. There's nothing more than have a lost man look you in the face and say, are you supposed to be doing that? I thank God for, for, I had a friend like that one time. I'm saved, I'm in a bar, I'm playing pool, and I'm having a beer. That guy looked at me, I'm witnessing to him. He says, are you supposed to be doing talking like that? Are you supposed to be doing that with us right here? And that got me out of that place, and that got me righter with God. I hope he got saved. But God had to use an unsaved man. And God will use unsaved people in our lives. That's what this king is. He's unsaved. So Shishak, verse 9, king of Egypt, came against Jerusalem. See, it didn't stop it. They repented. It didn't stop. And took away the treasures of the house of the Lord. Now get that. The treasures of the house of the Lord. That's important. And the treasures of the king's house. He took all he carried away. Also the shields of gold, which we, look, we looked at before, which Solomon had made. Now let's look at Exodus 3.22. About the house of the Lord. Exodus 3.22. And we got a, a statement here. I don't know what modern Bibles, I don't care what they say. I got the King James Bible. Exodus 3.22, watch this. But every woman shall borrow. That's the first time that word shows up in your Bible. Borrow. borrow you go to the bank you borrow money you don't keep it and back in the old days in the neighborhoods you know neighbor come over and say can i have a can i borrow a cup of sugar 
And sometimes they brought that sugar back or it would be, you know, I need some green beans. I owe you a cup of sugar. Can I have some green beans? There was some kind of barber service there. But borrow means it ain't yours. Watch it. Everyone shall borrow of her neighbor. That's the first time that word shows up. And her and he that sojourns in the house of jewels, silver, jewels of gold, rendment, you shall put them upon your sons, upon your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. Exodus eleven two. Exodus eleven two. Don't change the words in the Bible because you're only going to change the Bible. And you're going to change it not for good. So Exodus 11, 2. Speak now in the ears of the people. Let every man borrow of his neighbor, every woman of her neighbor, jewels of silver and jewels of gold. All right. Back over to Chronicles 12, 9. He took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the borrow. The king of Egypt got back everything they left. They borrowed that night. What were those treasures that was in the house? Was there not gold? Was there not silver? Were there not gems? Were there not clothing? Where did all that come from? It came from Egypt. No sooner I think Exodus 20, 21, or 22, in that neighborhood, the chapter, God says, let every man give of a willing heart gold, silver, precious stones, uh, they got goat's hair dyed red. They got badger skin. Uh, where did they get that? When they borrowed from Egypt. They didn't get to keep it. Like I said, I don't know what modern Bibles say, and I don't care, but if it doesn't say borrow in Exodus 3 and Exodus 11, you got a wrong Bible. Because Chronicles 22, verse 9 says the borrow is done. The king of Egypt got it back. And God knew that. And when God said borrow, that was prophecy. He said, you ain't going to keep it. Verse 10. All right, about the, gold, the shields of gold. And instead of which the king Rehoboam made shields of brass, that's lesser value. We know a guy who sells gold and silver. I don't think he would have brass at his table as great value if he did have gold silver and brass the gold would be a higher value next unto it would be uh the silver and a lower value would be brass so the standard of metals here of the value of metal and the chemical composition of metal has dropped and committed them to the hand of the chief of the guard, the, the main guy, that kept the entrance of the king's house. So here's a guy, here's the king living in this palace. He has a guy that's at the door of his, pal of his palace or his house. And he has put him in charge of these brazen shields. And when the king entered in the house of the Lord, did you see that? He's repented, he's gotten right, he's humbled himself, and he's back in the house of the Lord. There it is. The guard came and fetched them, those, those brass shields, and brought them again into the guard chamber. And then when, when the king, uh, Rehoboam's done, he would take those shields and he put them right back in his own house. That's his responsibility. If he were to come out and there was a mission shield, that would be the responsibility of that captain. Where's that mission shield? That's his responsibility. Verse 12, and when he humbled himself, repented, got right, no more pride, the wrath of, wrath of the Lord turned from him, that he would not destroy him altogether. He didn't wipe him off the map. And also Judah things went well but the king still came of egypt the, the house of the lord the house of the king has been looted and when they look at those brass shields oh we remember the day when it used to be gold there's a big scar left behind by the pride and by forsaking god 
And when you turn from God and you sin, it leaves a scar. And many, 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 many years, a scar can go away, but sometimes they don't. Again, not it's all about me, but on my ankle, my foot, I still got a, a scar, and I don't even remember. It had to do something with my bike chain. But it's there. Man, I was 10, 11, 12 years old, something like that, and it's still there. Some scars stay longer than others. And then there are scars. I remember what happened, but if I go looking, it's not there no more. And it's to remind me, one scar I did have in my belly one time, don't trust all windows to be no window. In other words, I thought there was a, <clears throat> I didn't think there was a window there and pressed against it and I found out the window had been cleaned and there was one in shattered glass. Just one of those life lessons. Scars can help us. And scars can ruin us. You can cause scars upon someone else. Sticks and soles may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That's a lie. You give somebody emotional scars, it'll hurt. But the scars of sin ought to remind you not to do it no more. So the king Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem. That's not good. We're doing a rehab of his life. And reigned. And Rehoboam was one and 40 years old when he began to reign. Now Solomon reigned 40 years in that overlap. Rehoboam was one year old when, when Solomon began to reign. When he began to reign, he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. The city which the Lord had chosen out of the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Nema. And Ammonitis. That's Lot's children. That's not Jew. That's not Hebrew. That's a mixed marriage. That was forbidden in the law. For the Jews. That will be a big problem when we get to Ezra and Nehemiah. Lord willing we get there. Hopefully before we get to Ezra and Nehemiah. The rapture will happen. We'll be going home. And he did evil. This is a summary. Because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. But we read he got right. We read he repented. Now the acts of Reboam the first and the last. Are they not written in the book of Shemaniah the prophet? Yes, they are. Where is it? We might be reading it. Or it may be a book that Holy Spirit said, Nope, I don't want that in the Bible. Don't go looking for it. And Ido the seer concerning genealogies. What is that? That could be Chronicles 1, 1 Chronicles. That's a whole list of genealogy. Or, the Holy Spirit said, nope, don't include that book. And there were wars between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually, civil war, north and south. You think America had a war between the north and the south? There were multiple wars between the north and south, Israel and Judah. And it will keep on going. Just because Rehoboam and Jeroboam died doesn't mean those civil wars stop. And Rehoboam slept his fathers who was buried in the city of David. And Abijah, that would be his son, reigned in his stead. But we close off another king. 